I think one has to fundamentally be passionate about being a practitioner. Business of Architecture, episode 341. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Business of Architecture is the leading business consultancy that helps you structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Build the business you need to do the work that you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today, I speak with Scott Kelsey, F-A-I-A. Kelsey is the managing principal of Co-Architects, a 120-person firm that has seen incredible success since its founding in 2006. Kelsey describes the firm as a practice-centered business, a firm that focuses on design while not ignoring the sound business fundamentals of a successful enterprise. This attitude and culture have allowed co-architects to become one of the world's leading firms in its chosen niches. In this episode, you'll discover the value-based, intentional approach that has helped this firm thrive. Hello, Scott. Welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thanks, Enoch. Nice to be here. Absolutely wonderful honor to have you on here. Now, the name of your firm, tell me, because it has a meaning behind it. Right. So explain to us how the firm got its name and and the meaning behind that. Right. So the name of the firm is Co Architects. Um, And the idea of Co is that it's a prefix um, meaning together. Um, And so the idea of Co Architects, when we named the firm, was that rather than naming it after an, an individual or a current group of leaders in the office, we named it after an idea and a way of working, which is around collaboration and connectedness and and sort of in concert. And so we, we're very much a, a sort of collaborative organization. We're much flatter in our organizational model. And so the co-prefix pretty much matched up with both how we worked and how we wanted to work as a practice in the future. Very interesting. And when you say that you're you're a flatter organization, tell me what does that look like? How does that play out in the firm? Right. So so the probably the best description of that is really in how we sort of manage the office. So we're a more broadly based organization. There there are many more individuals involved in the dialogue about firm strategy and firm management or practice management. Um, We're also, and so there's a lot more voices in the process. I mean, we do have hierarchy for certain issues, but I think in general, we, we support the idea of a lot of voices sort of helping think through and inform direction of the practice from a strategic and business point of view. Um, it's all also manifest in the fact that we have 18 shareholders in our organization of 120 people. So we're very, very broadly uh, held in terms of ownership. Uh, I think we're very much believers that we don't want to have a, a small group of owners that really sort of Uh, sort of own and drive the practice. We're very much interested in a practice that evolves and is a kind of practice into perpetuity. And so the ownership really reflects that. Got it. So we have a horizontal structure or more horizontality, or maybe let me, let me rephrase that for a second here. So in talking about the way the firm is structured, you mentioned that in terms of some, some strategy, uh, some management that happens with multiple voices. Right. Now, you've been a you've been leading this organization for a while. That's no small task to get people to agree and to come to a consensus. I'm curious to know, for you, what does it take to get a group of people to be engaged, to be bought in, to come together on a consensus and move forward with something like that? Right, right. Well, I I I think in the case of our organization, um, that is not. It's, it, it is a process that's really um, pretty organic. 
and it's it's really predicated on the fact that most of the leaders of our office have been together for well over a decade. And so we're pretty committed to each other and we're very much vested in the values of the office and what we're trying to achieve in the work. We're very much practice centric. Um, and so I think there's a natural dialogue that goes on, but, it, but at the same time, an understanding that that ultimately we will make sensible decisions in real time. And so for me, it's about bringing the right issues to this group of principals when it's appropriate. Um, and they respect that and they want to be part of the discussion. But ultimately, we make decisions in a relatively rapid fashion. There are certain issues that I just make decisions around or the management committee makes decisions around. So our organization is a group of principals and associate principals who meet on a regular basis and deliberate over strategy issues. A management committee that I chair that really deals with the weekly, monthly kind of issues, financial issues. Um, and so it's a sort of a dynamic between that small decision making group of the management committee and the larger principal group. And so that sort of back and forth is what really drives our practice from a business perspective. Got it. So in addition to your position uh, as the head of the management committee or being on that committee, what are you what are your what would you say your day to day role in the firm? Well, in our office, um, my role is really is really kind of focused on sort of three fundamental areas. One is kind of sort of helping run the office and setting a strategy and making sure strategy gets um, executed. Uh, The second is really around business development and marketing and networking and connecting with clients and peers and colleagues and consultants. And the third area is really working on projects. So I spend 30, 40 percent of my time working on projects in a principal in charge capacity, very much kind of front loaded in the design process and programming process. So that's nominally sort of the three baskets of my work. Um, And depending upon the month and the week, I spend more time on one versus another. But that's that's fundamentally where I spend my energy. It is surprising to hear to hear you say that you spend so much time on projects. Right, uh, that can be right. that can be very time intensive, especially when you have a large step to sheer, steer, uh, right. such as co architects. Tell me why that is. Is that part of the philosophy? Is it because you enjoy being down there? And I, I refer to it not down there as down the hierarchy, down the chain, but let's say on the drawings, working with the clients. Yeah, it's a good question. So, our office and the leaders of the office are all very project centric. And we're very much a design first organization. And so I think that I and others have the shared belief that the way to continue to emphasize that philosophy is by doing the work. You have to to be involved with doing work and working with clients. uh, and so you can't move away from that. So that's really kind of our our approach here. Scott, you mentioned that important part of what you do is strategy, and that me- that word is a big word. It has a lot of meaning for different people. For you, yeah. what would you say strategy is? Well, strategy in in the context of our office is really about thinking through kind of where we are as a practice, what kinds of projects we're working on, what clients we serve, um, what states we work in, and thinking through from a long-term point of view where we want to go with that in in the different practice sectors that we work in. So I spend a certain amount of my time looking at the kind of what I would call the kind of ebb and flow of different project types that we work on, trying to understand kind of the various conditions that influence different practice sectors emerging and rising and others going down and trying to sort of think about where we are going as an overall practice. Um, that's, That's one issue. 
The other, in terms of strategy, is we're also thinking a lot about what are the emerging project types that fit into our philosophy of work. Um, so we sometimes think of that as our blue ocean, sort of thinking about emerging building types, maybe hybridized building types, new programs, new client types um, that we can become more skilled in to sort of open up our practice sectors more. Because I think one of the things that is the case with our practice is that we've always, always been a firm that has focused on the institutional building type, whether it's science and technology or academic buildings or medical education or K through 12 or healthcare. And those are project types that are really uh, important to us. But at the same time, we're also wanting to think about other allied building types that fit within that umbrella, that fit under that umbrella of work type that will enable us to grow um, and to be more skilled and to serve new clients. So part of my so strategic thinking is, is kind of what do I see out on the horizon line that might fit into that? Yeah. Tell me more about the emerging building types. What are you, what are you seeing? What's emerging? Well, I think, I, I think what we're seeing um, is kind of in, in kind of two realms, maybe. The, the first realm is that we're seeing new building types, which I would call kind of hybridized buildings. So meaning buildings that have sort of cross-disciplinary activity, whether it's say um, inpatient, outpatient in the healthcare setting, or whether it's an academic building that's not purely one discipline, it's actually multiple academic disciplines under one roof, for instance, as an example. Um, it might be buildings that cross um, outpatient care with housing. You know, think about um, continuum of care facilities, things like that. So we're looking at, we're sort of looking at and trying to strategically understand these new kind of emerging building types. Um, in the sectors that we're strong in, right? Um, so that's one part. The other part is really looking at trying to get further and further upstream with clients that we work with and help them and be a strategic partner to them in understanding their college campus and where they wanna grow and um, what emerging programs they need to be thinking about. So trying, as opposed to just simply looking at bricks and mortar or programming, we're actually doing strategic planning for them as a kind of um, acknowledged and understood partner in their strategic planning process. I love it. And I would imagine that filters down into the business development because that sounds like a great strategy to show up as a, a valued contributor to your clients. Right. That's exactly right. So, so obviously, we have long-term relationships with certain clients that we've developed over a span of 20, 25 years. And so we're constantly looking for ways to sort of support them and to bring more high level uh, sort of planning, programming, master planning, sort of technology planning um, into their, you know, into their uh, environment. For you, what would be the top say three to four, maybe even five key skills or attributes that someone needs to have to be what we might call a leader in an architecture firm? Well, I, again, I'll, I'll reflect on our office. Um, I, I think one has to be, I think one has to fundamentally be passionate about being a practitioner. I think you have to really want to practice and design and to program and to execute buildings. I think you have to be grounded in your belief as a practitioner. Um, I think you have to be a very good communicator and you have to be a good networker and you have to bring people together and you have to bring people together in a strategic way to help make decisions and, and to help people feel engaged in that decision making process. Um, I think that you have to be um, as much as possible, comfortable with being uncomfortable, meaning you have tell to me what you mean to, by that. <laughs> well, you, you have to learn how to be in environments or situations where people are telling you things that you may not fully understand. Maybe perhaps you're in a different age generation. You grew up 
and practice in a different environment. And you have to be willing to sort of open your mind up and listen and to be uncomfortable with the dialogue in order to recognize that which makes sense ultimately for the future of your practice. And I think that's important. And I think, again, from my perspective, I think a good leader recognizes the value of multiple inputs and ultimately perspectives and input from very young people that often see things very differently from you, but ultimately can can really make for powerful change within the organization. Leading a firm like Co-Architects, managing principal can't be a super easy task. What would you say would be the things over the years that have really been instrumental in your skills as a leader and, and building you up to be able to handle this current level of responsibility? Well, I think, I think in my particular case, um, it was being trained and mentored by people that I succeeded who worked very patiently with me and helped me understand the values of our organization and how to, how to lead in difficult uh, conditions and also gave me the proper business training because as you know, architects don't get business training you don't get communication training in school. And so all of this you kind of learn um, and also um, gave me good mentorship in terms of um, connecting into the outside community. And so for me, a lot of it boils down to that, number one. And number two, it's also being around a group of people that are extremely cohesive and are very supportive of each other and sort of help each other be better at what we're doing. Um, and so we have an organization that really fosters collegiality and support and rigor and debate. Um, but we're very much focused on where we want to go and how we can help each other get there. And that, that I think is uh, really important in my own personal growth and in the growth of the organization. Got it. And when you're speaking of the mentorship that happened, was that something that happened organically because of who these people were uh, or did you have specific structures in the business to facilitate that or something else? Well, I, I think in our office, the, the mentorship is important. We have a pretty structured mentorship program in the office now. Yeah. Can you tell us about that specifically? Yeah. So, yeah, so in our office, um, we have a program where um, younger professionals, um, can seek out a mentor, a more senior individual. It could be a principal level or associate principal, senior associate, and they develop a relationship. Um, and then over a period of one year, they get together, you know, once or twice a month um, over coffee or over, over lunch to sort of share ideas. Um, but what's important about that, Enoch, is that the relationship is not a one-way relationship. In other words, the, re the most recent woman that I mentored, I, we both understood that it's a two-way street here. She's giving me feedback and advice, and I'm asking her about things. And at the same time, I'm a mentor to her to offer her perspective on her own personal growth. Um, and so the program is pretty formalized. And so I've probably mentored about four or five people over the last four years. And so that's a really successful program in the office. When I was younger, I was mentored by what was then the managing principal, and I worked very closely with him and learned a lot from him. And in particular, learned a lot about the values of the organization and what's important and, and sort of how do we emphasize our practice culture. Um, and so that's really important. So it's not just a matter of saying, well, you should have said this, that, or here's how to look at a balance sheet. That's all important stuff. But it's also about understanding the larger purpose of the organization and, and continuing that forward. Yeah, I get that. I get that, that you've built an organization upon the values that then inform the conversation. So it's not like you have a rote checklist of do this in this situation. You may have some of that, but right. really right. what I hear from you is that it's really about learning the values that drive and, and the culture that right. you're creating there at, at the right. firm. Right. It's difficult to do. I mean, creating an organization, really having a culture, 
uh, that's a positive culture that has bought in people uh, who are excited to utilize all their strengths together is is difficult. So congratulations and acknowledge you for what you and your team have done at Co. What would right. you say would be the keys to creating that kind of synergy amongst people? Well, from my perspective, Enoch, I think it's about it's about treating people fairly. It's having a culture of fairness. I think it's about having a culture of openness and willingness to change. It's about having a culture where I recognize that that this is a practice that will move forward into the future. And I'm constantly looking for and engaging with people that will ultimately become the future practice caretakers. So, so we think of ourselves, the current group of principals think of themselves as the current practice caretakers, as opposed to thinking about this is, this is our office. We're responsible for it currently, but we also recognize that, that other people will stand on our shoulders and we will move it forward. And so I think that's very much sort of baked in to who we are, that we see ourselves as individuals that are really driving the practice forward and will make room for the next generation of people. And that's very much, I mean, that's baked into how we own stock, how we buy it, how we sell it, the age of, of, of owners and so on and so forth, that we constantly have evolution, both from a financial and stock perspective, as well as from a leadership perspective. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I'd love to hear more about that as much as you can share. Uh, obviously, with things like fairness, openness, and willingness to change, those are incredible values that I think appeal to a lot of people. However, I know there are there are firms and companies out there that play lip service to those, right? And that maybe it's not really involved in the culture. I get a different sense from your team that actually these are real things that happen. What's What's the key there to actually taking lofty ideals like that and actually making sure that these are really things that are happening in the business and not just a slogan on the website or something that we aspire to. Right. Well, I, I think it's really, I think it's really, it's, it's, it's predicated on a shared vision by a group of, of senior people who've been together, most of which we've been together for well over 20 years. So, there's a lot of continuity and, and a lot of investment. And so therefore, I think that our shared values are really based upon our, our real commitment to the practice and to each other. Um, I also think from a sort of, I'll, I'll call it from, a, from an organizational point of view and from a kind of stock ownership point of view, we've written instruments into the organization that make sure that happens, that make sure that ownership transitions. So you, you can't be at co-architects for the rest of your life and own your ownership and just say, it's mine, I built it, I made this place, and I'm gonna hold on as long as I want. You can't do that in the office. So, so we have both the contractual and ownership metrics that make sure there's change, and we have a commitment as a group of people that we support that in terms of our activities, if that makes sense to you, Enoch. Ab absolutely fascinating. I mean, great, great to put together. The vision goes back to the vision of the leadership team. The people have then been there for a long time, and right. then also making sure that that's reinforced through the policies, through the the contracts with the employees, through the compensation, the ownership. That's right. So, if I've heard you correctly, there there's some sort of clause probably that says that once you reach a certain age, mm -hmm. that you leave the firm and that people that leave the firm are no longer owners that somehow they have to sell back their stock. Can you give me some idea about the, the key points there that you feel have created that, that kind of inclusive culture? Yeah, I think, I think the key points for us is that our organization, our office was founded on the belief that there should be broad based ownership and, um, there's also a belief that um, we, there's also a belief that there won't be dominant owners in our organization. As you probably know, many smaller organizations will have a small cadre of owners 
that have major control from an ownership perspective. The challenge with that is at some point people get older and they want to move on and it puts the younger people in peril because they're not able to transition the ownership, right? They, they're unable to purchase it. They don't have the money to purchase it. And, and so what happens is it, it sets up this very difficult dynamic uh, within the organization. So we purposefully have said, we do not want to have dominant shareholders. We want a sort of regular ownership level across a much greater group of people so that at any given time, stock can be bought and stock can be sold and the organization can sustain that. So just by way of example, in the last 15 years, we've transitioned almost 80% of the stock of co-architects. Wow. So that's, that's the proof of our system. It works. And it's a very vibrant organization and it treats people fairly. And also when people leave, um, they have benefit, they receive benefit from that. So it's both the year over year investment, the collegiality is what you receive when you leave, but it's the ability for new people to buy in and continue that transition. And what's the process for new people buying and how do you decide that, that this person's gonna be able to get some ownership in the firm? Yeah, it's a good question. So in our office, um, principals and associate principals, they own stock. Um, and so it's a very, it's, it's really a, a promotion process of really deliberation around um, those individuals. And it's a very sort of methodical, evaluative process for people to become an associate principal. When you, when you become promoted and you, be, and you join that group, be it an associate principal, principal, then you're offered shares as part of your leadership responsibilities. Got it. Got it. It's it's very apparent from your website, and you mentioned it earlier in our interview today that you view co-architects view themselves as a practiced centered business, meaning that right. design is at the forefront. You mentioned how uh, even you, as a managing principal, spend a large portion of your time on projects. That's right. What would you say are some of the challenges that you have being an organization that cares, uh, thinks of itself as design first, shall we say? Right. Well, the, the, challenge, the challenges are that um, the decisions that we make are not always black and white decisions. We don't make a decision um, that's purely business based. We make a decision about what's right for the project. So inherently what that means is that you have this dynamic of projects that may have difficult financial straits, but you know what you need to do in order to make sure that that project is successful from a design and, and client service perspective. And so that creates some discomfort sometimes, especially if you're in difficult financial situations um, or you're trying to balance projects that are doing well versus projects that are doing a little less well. But I think our belief is we don't think of our work as being in unique sectors that each have profit and loss goals, we treat it as one practice because Enoch, we're a, we're a team-based organization. So when you join our office, you might work on a healthcare project, you might work on an academic building, you might work on a high school, you might work on a, a research laboratory. But at the end of the day, the sum total of the success of the office is all of those projects taken together. And that's how we measure our success rather than saying this project's having a problem and this one's doing better and why is that the case? We need to get to the bottom of that. So we tend to look at more in the collective. Um, and that's, you know, we, we have quite good business metrics. So we believe that you can be good at business and you can be profitable and you can continue this model of ownership transition, which by the way is based upon good financial metrics. They have to be good or people don't want to be a part of the organization. And at the same time, you can do good design. You can do excellent design and you can undertake excellent client service. So for us, it's not an either or, it's kind of a both hand, but we are very much focused on our work. I get that. I get that. Well, a lot of my questions today uh, Scott, it, it's first of all, great having you on the podcast today have really been around that idea of team, culture, values, 
uh, which I see coming through the ethos of just what's on the website and what it, my interactions with with co architects and what you've said here. And it's it's fascinating, and I uh, commend you for what you've created. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'm very proud of the office, and and we have really terrific people in the office. And what I would say is that the office has continued to evolve as a practice over the last decade and where we are today and where we were five years ago, and five years before that is, is very much in a positive trajectory. So I'm very proud of that. Excellent. And of course, when I say, when I say what you've created, I refer to the entire team right. at co-architects because That's I know exactly that you, right. you acknowledge that. So yeah. we hopefully they get a chance to listen to this and hear, hear you talking about what they do and the, the kind of the bones of the company. Thank you, Scott Kelsey, for being here with us today on the business of architecture. Great. Thank you, Enoch. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.